So hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in uh, today's call on Saturday uh, morning. Um, we are doing this session on uh, on a very uh, interesting topic that is Gift City. Uh, everyone is talking about it, uh, but we will uh, go into the nuances of Gift City. And we have with us uh, Mr. Mihir Shirgaonkar. Um, he is head of alternative investments at Philip Ventures. And he manages their global PMS and investment advisory business at Philip Ventures IFSD, domiciled in Gift City, Gujarat. He has more than eight years of experience in asset management industry. He is a chartered accountant and CFA charter holder, and he has done his MBA from IIM Ahmedabad. Previously, he has worked with DSP Investment Managers and HDFC AMC in his previous roles. So thank you, uh, Mihir, for joining in today's call and addressing our audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aditya, and a very good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, on a Saturday morning. Uh, I think after a busy week, uh, you know, you taking us time for all of us is, uh, I think, really means a lot. So once again, thank you so much and really excited to share our thoughts on Gift City and, uh, you know, the global markets and what we really see going forward. Yeah. Right. So I'll start with a very basic question. Uh, what is yeah. Gift City? Uh, can you help us understand uh, more about this this particular term? Sure. Uh, so Gift City, uh, you know, of course, everyone has been hearing about it. Everyone has been uh, reading about it. Uh, you know, people are becoming more and more aware. But just to give you, you know, a wider context uh, with, you know, what was the objective uh, of Gift City? So Gift City, uh, you know, by design is India's first integrated smart city. And it is envisaged to be India's gateway to the global markets. So it is actually India's own offshore jurisdiction. So when, when it assumes the status of an offshore jurisdiction, it typically means that uh, it, is a, a, it is a location which is territorially within India. But for all exchange control purposes, it is considered to be a region which is outside India. And this status alone gives Gift City a completely different set of implications when it comes to banking, when it comes to the markets and, you know, all the other financial services that are coming in. So, as I mentioned, Gift City is India's gateway to the global markets and it is envisaged uh, for uh, two things primarily. One is uh, a lot of non-resident Indians and foreign nationals can better access the Indian capital markets uh, through the kind of products that are coming in Gift City. And secondly, uh, the route which we uh, began our journey with is typically enabling resident Indians as well as, let's say, other investors to invest in the global markets. So we have our own businesses in Gift City and uh, like firms are coming up which are setting up their own uh, investment desks in Gift City and offering investment products which enables investors to invest globally. So that is the second objective. So both ways it is functioning, uh, you know, typically India's gateway as it is rightly envisaged and being executed as well. Yes, Aditya. Right, right. And uh, as you rightly said, it works both ways for uh, for the resident Indians to invest into glo global products and uh, non-residents to invest into Indian capital markets. That's correct. So in fact, there is a third category as well, which invariably mm -hmm. we only have, uh, you know, perhaps introduced. And it is non-residents investing into the global markets, again, by right. using Gift City. And this itself, uh, you know, is very unique because uh, let's say any investors sitting in a Dubai or a Middle East, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, now this investor will have his or her own avenues to invest globally, but still they come to Gift City. So it only speaks about the kind of credibility which now Gift City is slowly and steadily enjoying in the minds of investors. Because Gift City, you know, by design and, you know, just to add on to this, uh, is managed by a completely different regulator, uh, the IFSCA, which is the International Financial Services Centers Authority. So this is, uh, this is a regulator which functions completely distinct from SEBI and RBI jurisdiction. And it, it functions as a unified authority, like a unified regulator. So all uh, capital market as well as financial services businesses within Gift City are governed by this regulator. And again, uh, it is the endeavor of the regulator to have a lot of globally benchmarked best practices. Uh, you know, 
and that is you know one of the key reasons why increasingly there is a lot of awareness uh, and a lot of interest uh, for global investors uh, you know to explore the gift city route uh, right right and when it come to nris particularly investing into indian products right. um, um they have a lot of operational uh, hassles in opening an uh, an nre nro account correct and transferring the money so right. how does the investing process works for an nri uh, is there a new bank account uh, that's opened under ifsc for them and how does the operational uh, right work out for the nris correct now uh, it it would you know really depend on the kind of product so if it is a pms structure investing into the indian markets uh, so then uh, they may not be required to open a bank account but uh, again the dmat account and those processes are similar but if you look at some of the fund based structures so a lot of aif structures coming in gift city uh, aifs which are investing into the indian markets Uh, the biggest value proposition for non-residents and foreign nationals is that they are not required to open any separate bank account in gift city and you know as aditya you very rightly mentioned that you know all the processes around nro and nre you know typically uh, coming under the pis route of rbi uh, right. if let's say such investors are, are to access indian products directly maybe a pms uh, an ei for a mutual fund so they are required to undergo significant amount of paperwork but here you know if they are coming through the gift city route uh, they are not required to open any bank account of course the other processes of kyc uh, you know the the verification uh, the background check everything remains the same uh, uh, definitely you know that stays but uh, the very fact that they don't have to open a bank account separately they can quite literally invest uh, you know directly using their dollar to dollar account because in gift city uh, largely the unit of currency is the us dollar so they can directly make a dollar to dollar remittance uh, and you know that is how the fund manager then takes it forward and then you know can make the investments and investors in this aif kind of a product will get issued units as well so that is you know significantly reduces the operational hassles uh, right 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 uh, and now coming back to the resident indians uh, who are investing that they, they are into global products yeah uh they they come under uh, lrs scheme whatever money that they transfer that's correct yes uh and how does it work out in case of gift city and how is the global pms uh, offered in gift city different from uh, say an india based mutual fund that is offering overseas exposure right uh, so it uh, differs on two counts i would say first is uh, you know i'll address the banking bit first um, mm-hmm. so you know as you said that because a uh, gift city is an offshore jurisdiction so any money which is remitted to gift city uh, transferred to gift city is considered to be money which is remitted outside india if if a resident indian is doing it and for that the investor will come under the lrs so while the investor doesn't have to open a bank account but you know that procedure of the form a2 which the investor would have any which ways filled for any other foreign payment that comes into picture uh, right. as compared to that if you look at a mutual fund offering a global product uh, indian like resident indian mutual fund uh, offering a global investment so these lrs implications don't apply uh, the larger challenge of course however could be that uh, under lrs the investor can remit a maximum of 250000 us dollars in one financial year per pan number uh now the investor can obviously remit more uh, amount in equivalent rupees to an india based mutual fund but mutual funds have their own industry wide caps uh, and uh, you know th- those are implemented by the rbi and you you do have cases where such mutual funds you know stop accepting payments from investors uh, but that is definitely not the case for gift city so you know that is uh, one aspect of it uh, the second primary difference uh, uh, comes around taxation now in last year's budget uh, with the entire uh, concept of specified mutual funds so all debt mutual funds uh, you know commodity based mutual funds or even uh, the few, uh, the foreign feeder funds right. the entire income of that uh, scheme like whenever the investor is redeeming units uh, is is taxed as a short term capital gain and that makes this product uh, you know some bit uh, less attractive 
But if you look at a global PMS, you know, such as ourselves, so because these are discretionary managed accounts and it is a PMS after all. So the investor is actually holding those individual global securities. So there is security level taxation. And because these are directly overseas securities, the normal capital gains uh, taxation uh, should apply is, is the guidance that we have from our consultant. So here, whenever the portfolio is getting churned, uh, the investors uh, will uh, face the uh, the incidence of taxation. So here, the long-term capital gains will be taxed at 20% and you know, with the benefit of indexation. Short-term capital gains will be at their regular rate of taxation. So this is one point which investors can take note of because even if, let's say, in case of our mutual funds, we are uh, investing in global equity-based uh, instruments, so that doesn't mean that the equity taxation in India applies. Uh, the normal capital gains taxation applies. Um, I hope this answers. Right, right. Taxation, none, that makes a huge difference. Right. Um, when when you are significantly building exposure Correct. in global products. Right, right, right. And uh, so for for uh, domestic PMS, uh, we understand that there is a minimum ticket size of 3 lakhs uh, that is set by SEBI. Um, lakhs, what, yes. what, what is the uh, minimum ticket size uh, uh, or what is the usual ticket size that is there in the gift right. so, so according to the IFSCF fund management regulations, uh, and I quote these regulations because we are a registered fund management entity in gift city under which license uh, we are offering the global PMS. Uh, the minimum ticket size is 1,50,000 US dollars. So that roughly translates to 1.20 crore rupees uh, for the investor. Uh, right. The other thing which investors may want to take note of is that there is a 20% TCS as well, which the investors will have to pay over and above it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it comes across as, uh, you know, let's say a shocker for some investors because uh, for a 1,50,000 US dollar investment, the investor may have to actually arrange for 1,80,000 US dollars because they will have to pay that TCS over and above. Of course, TCS does become a more like a cash flow management issue. It is substantial nonetheless, uh, so no denying here. But, uh, you know, definitely, uh, you know, at least if it is an, uh, let's say, an HNI investor who in which ways could be paying substantial sums in a self-assessment tax later on, uh, they can always use the credit of this TCS to uh, pay a lesser tax, uh, you know, at the time of income tax return filing. So that is, you know, about the ticket size. But now uh, the same regulations also say that if the investor is an accredited investor, then mm -hmm. the minimum ticket size need not apply. So in which case, if okay. the investor fulfills the criteria for accredited investors, uh, they can actually invest uh, with an amount lesser than one lakh fifty thousand US dollars also. Uh, just about a couple of weeks back, uh, you know, slightly more actually, uh, the guidelines for accredited investor are finally out. And, you know, as I'm speaking to you today, our compliance team is already working on an internal policy uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, implement the accredited investor piece. So that should, uh, you know, because 1,50,000 US dollars, at least for some investors, could be a substantial sum. Also, given the fact that there is an right. upper cap of 2,50,000 US dollars. But now okay. I think we are definitely getting a renewed interest, especially uh, because of the way the world markets really were last year. Uh, so, you know, again, uh, we've received a lot of interest and we are seeing those kind of flows as well in our PMS. Sure, sure. And uh, uh, now moving from regulatory and operational uh, <clears throat> sector, uh, how do you see, uh, let's talk about international diversification. Uh, because yeah. uh, in India, particularly uh, in mutual fund setup, there are not many products that offer international diversification. Right. Uh, and how does uh, allocation in a global product and global equity uh, help in the overall portfolio of the client? Sure, sure. Uh, I think a very, very relevant question, uh, actually. Because today, uh, uh, you know, as, as we keep on discussing also that uh, there is definitely a lot of awareness uh, among Indian investors also. Uh, Indian investors of today are much uh, like, like of today are much more knowledge driven. Uh, they are much more updated with the global events. Uh, sitting here in India, uh, they would be very, very uh, up to date about, you know, some of the policies of the US Federal Reserve, for example. 
so uh, you know definitely there is an awareness but then uh, you know uh, the journey from that awareness to actually uh, making a case for global investing uh, we would uh, you know essentially address this on three parameters first is uh, when you actually look at the way the global markets have really returned in the in the previous decade now if you look at the returns a bit of you know some of the largest equity benchmarks globally uh, you know if you see uh, we can find that during the period 2000 to 2020 i mean that entire 2010 to 2020 i'm sorry in this entire decade it is actually the us markets that did considerably better than uh, you know some of the uh, in fact all the other benchmarks uh, if you really look in terms of the cagr terms so yes nifty was also one of the best performing benchmarks even nifty did give you a double digit cagr during that period but the returns from let's say the s&p 500 were comparable and nasdaq definitely the returns were far higher on a cagr basis that's number one uh, now what is missing in point number one is the fact that these returns that i'm talking about are the local currency returns if you actually factor in the impact of rupee depreciation uh, if we really have to think in terms of how much an indian investor investing indian rupees in an s&p 500 would have made so the indian investor would have actually made returns on two counts one is the underlying return of the s&p 500 and second is the depreciation of the indian rupee so if you actually convert the dollar returns into rupee returns and then compare it with nifty 50 you would have found that in the previous decade uh, the case for a global investing is even stronger so that is the second uh, advantage. So first advantage, of course, is, uh, I mean, as I mentioned, that while India is one of the best performing economies, uh, as a global fund manager, uh, I really cannot shy away from the fact that India is expected to be some of the, one of the fastest growing economies. In fact, uh, by 2028, it is said that India's GDP growth will surpass that of, uh, you know, that of China. And in terms of percentage growth, India is expected to grow much faster than the US, China, and you know all these other uh, nations as well. Great. But what the previous decade did prove to us is that a faster growing economy need not mean un necessarily mean a better performing equity market. So while the core allocation for uh, for an investor can remain uh, Indian equities or the Indian securities, uh, you should also be cognizant of the fact that there are pockets of opportunities in other parts of the world as well which you know through the right set of uh, let's say investment products uh, investors can actually factor in and capture those returns in their portfolio as well second is of course uh, you know as i mentioned the depreciation of the indian rupee uh, now just like any other asset class even the rupee will have its own cycles of ups and downs now since 2022 the indian rupee witnessed a very sharp depreciation relative to the us dollar uh, will we actually see the same kind of depreciation, uh, you know, in the coming years as well? Uh, so my personal expectation is that yes, you could accept, uh, you, you could expect a modest depreciation when we look in a CAGR terms, but you know, on an average, one and a half to two and a half percent on an average is the kind of depreciation which is, uh, you know, which can be considered reasonable. But now coming to the third and perhaps the most important value proposition for a global portfolio. If we really look at the markets around us and, uh, you know, especially if we now step into the current decade, because whatever I have mentioned so far is things that have already happened. And uh, obviously the question for all of us could be what next? So when we actually look in the pre current decade, uh, what we realize is that there are a lot of global trends, uh, you know, happening in markets around us. And, you know, I'll just list down some of those trends. So the first trend is what we call, call as a grand reset. Now, uh, if you look at the entire COVID-19 pandemic and the disruptions that it really brought about across businesses, across regions, uh, across supply chains, what has really happened is that businesses across the globe have started to rethink their business models. And, uh, you know, there is a definitely, there is in some sense, there is the sense of deglobalization that we can see. I had even written about it uh, as part of one of my articles for the CFA Institute. You can check it on the newsletter as well. So there is, you know, one deglobalization because of which a lot of other economies outside of, let's say, China uh, can actually, you know, see some opportunities. Uh, you know, that is number one. 
Second is the kind of disruptions that we've already seen in businesses starting with the previous decade. Because in the previous decade also, when I spoke about these returns, if we really look at the returns of NASDAQ, uh, they have actually been very strong starting from the second half of the previous decade. And what these strong returns of NASDAQ really suggest to us or the insight that we, uh, we conclude from this is that in the previous decade as well as the current ones, the markets have actually rewarded those countries, those companies and those businesses which are actually at the forefront of technology disruptions and innovations. Uh, today, you know, when we are talking about uh, the magnificent seven companies in the US, okay, the Apples, Amazons and the other companies. So there is, you know, increasingly there is a wider adoption of artificial intelligence. Uh, artificial intelligence, which is, uh, you know, actually bringing out a lot of efficiencies in the way businesses are being carried out globally. There is significant cost reduction on certain counts and because of which the profits of uh, a lot of companies uh, is actually improving. Now, our opinion is that these benefits of AI will actually flow to those companies or those, uh, let's say, regions which are the early adopters of this technology. So will India catch up? The answer is yes, definitely. But a wide-scale adoption of some of these industry 4.0 technologies could be a decade away. Now, I have gone on record in saying that India has some of the brightest scientific minds in the world today. But in terms of infrastructure, it is getting built up. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, the, we, we've got the right policies in place. We've got the right, uh, you know, infrastructure plans in place. So definitely that infrastructure is coming up. But currently, you know, if we see, uh, you know, the, if you look at the developed part of the world, so they are already early adopters of these technologies. And we are really talking about concepts like semiconductors. There is artificial intelligence. Uh, let's say a lot of awareness around ESG or we could talk about electric vehicles or you know robotics and a lot of other investment themes as we would like to call them. Now, these are ideas which we believe will drive the next leg of global growth. But we also believe that these are ideas which may or may not be accessible if you are looking at only the listed Indian equity space. And this alone is the largest value proposition that uh, we would, uh, you know, that we are offering through our products to give investors an opportunity uh, to capture growth stories across innovations as well as regional developments and to allocate to what we call as the trends of today as well as the ideas of tomorrow. So this uh, makes the case for a global portfolio uh, very, very strong. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, so coming back to your portfolio, could you right. throw some light on on the geographies uh, where you are allocating and on the sectors where you you've already touched upon uh, upon the sectors, but uh, you can just, uh, throw some more light uh, uh, on specific weights on on the sectors and the geographies. Surely, and yeah. your investment philosophy. Surely, surely. Uh, so the name of the portfolio, uh, the name of our portfolio is very apt. Uh, the global PMS strategy that we are offering is the Philip International Pioneer Portfolio. Uh, and why do I say that the name is very apt? Because we have effectively pioneered global investing through Gift City. Uh, we are the first operational fund in Gift City who is offering a global PMS. And uh, this is a portfolio where we are investing, uh, you know, across regions and businesses. Uh, the entire idea or the entire investment objective of our portfolio is to generate capital appreciation by investing into various geographies, sectors, and businesses, which we believe will grow over the medium to long term. Uh, and uh, uh, so that is, you know, our idea. Uh, while we are talking about uh, innovations and, you know, the forward-looking industries, uh, we started the fund in 2022, that to the early part of 2022. So we were very, very cognizant of the kind of volatility that could be ahead of us because of the way interest rates were set to rise and the way inflation was spiraling out of control. So when we are talking about investing in these innovations or uh, let's say ideas of tomorrow, that does not necessarily mean that this is a technology heavy portfolio. Yes, there is a, you know substantial investment into technology. Uh, you know, if I have to speak about the top sectors in our portfolio, so it is technology, there is healthcare, and then there is financials. And then we've got a lot of, uh, you know, other investment themes, which are categorized as thematic. 
uh, so no, if I really have to list down some of the uh, businesses that we've invested in, uh, you know, through the through our securities. So we've invested in areas such as semiconductors, cloud computing. Uh, okay, there is medical devices that we've invested in. Uh, we've invested in uranium also. So we actually have investment products that are actually giving us exposure to something like uranium. Uh, in fact, if I have to take a step back, I can tell you that ours is a portfolio which is investing in ETFs. We are not directly investing in stocks or bonds, but we are investing in ETFs. Uh, you know, as, as uh, let's say investors, people may have this one very obvious question that why are you investing in ETFs, uh, you know, when you, when you can directly invest in stocks and bonds? Or even if we have to take another step back here, whenever we say ETFs, the first thing that could come to investors' mind could be a Sensex ETF, a Nifty ETF, or maybe a Bank Nifty ETF. So investors could definitely wonder that if the fund manager is indeed investing in global exposures only or the broader market exposures, why would you allocate to a fund manager? What is the true value addition? So this is where, you know, our investment philosophy comes into picture. So first is, uh, you know, if I, I mean, I'll now delve into a very, very detailed discussion on our investment philosophy. First is when we actually talk about the universe of ETFs uh, in the US markets, because we are doing only US listed ETFs. What we find is that uh, the investments are available not only at a broader market level, but at a sector level. And then even within sectors, we have ETFs available on individual businesses and individual investment themes. So what I mean by that is I'll just give you an example. Now, if you look at a sector like healthcare in the US, uh, so like similar to technology, even healthcare in the US is very vast. And within healthcare, you have businesses such as medical devices, biotechnology, there is genomic revolution, there is pharmaceuticals, there is a digital wellness, for example. Now, these are five different businesses within healthcare. And each of these businesses have different risk and reward characteristics. A very generic, how do I say, trend in healthcare need not necessarily affect each of these businesses in the exact same fashion. Now, I just gave you an example of healthcare. But there are, you know, such investments or such businesses, uh, you know, across the, these 11 sectors in the US. And you have ETFs giving you specific exposures only to these businesses. So you have ETFs giving you exposures only to semiconductors or only to medical devices or only to cloud computing. So what we are actually doing as part of our portfolio allocation is we are making a very conscious selection of some of the best performing businesses, which we believe will grow over the medium to long term. So that's one element of the portfolio. The second element is a regional exposure. Now today, the market for US listed ETFs alone gives you access to more than 50 to 60 different regions globally. Even in our, uh, like in our portfolio uh, or as part of our research, we are monitoring more than 35 different countries. So, uh, and each of these investable using only US listed ETFs. So, I mean, if I have to invest in a Taiwan, for example, I will not go in the Taiwan stock exchange and then grapple with currencies. We will simply buy the US dollar denominated Taiwan focused ETF, which is trading on the American exchanges. So what we've actually done at our end as part of our uh, back testing and initial research is that we've individually studied you know, the sector focused funds in the US and curated a list of more than 70 different investable businesses, you know, using only ETFs. You know, you have all sorts of businesses, you know, you have some suddenly gold miners, copper miners, energy transition materials, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a list which is very, very internal and specific only to Philip Capital. It is not a list that you will actually find on the public domain. So we have actually curated this list in house. That's number one. And second is, of course, you know, some of these countries that I told you that, uh, you know, more than 35 countries are under our watch. Uh, we are constantly monitoring, uh, you know, events in these countries and how these events and how these developments are actually translating into the equity returns from these countries. So that is something that we monitor. Which may still bring us to another question that today, you know, there is so much awareness even around ETFs. Uh, if any of the investors were to open their own trading account, let's say, uh, they can have access to all these ETFs. 
uh, they could uh, they might as well pick and choose ETFs on their own. Why do they still need a fund manager? Is 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 the question that you may have. Um, so here, uh, you know, uh, I can tell you is that if you really look at the U.S. markets, only in the years 2020, 2021, 2022, as well as 2023, in each of these four years, there have been more than 400 new ETF launches every single year. So just imagine uh, if a year is consisting of 250 or 260 trading sessions in a year, on an average, every single day in each of these four years, the investor will have more than one new ETF on an average to invest in. You know, or at least that is the kind of choice available. And then there is so much information overload. Suddenly there are Bitcoin ETFs coming up. Suddenly there are video gaming ETFs coming up. You have ETFs on, you know, something like pet care and other areas as well. Uh, there could be merit in these businesses, you know, we are not really denying them, but investors at times do get so much spoiled for choice that they may en either end up dipping their feet everywhere uh, uh, only to realize that the portfolio is very large and the investment allocation is very, very suboptimal. Or they may be, you know, so much overloaded with information that they may not be able to decide. So this entire journey of more than 4,000 US listed ETFs to that final 15 to 20 ETFs that form our investment portfolios is, is the result of our investment philosophy. Uh, it, is, it is the result of a very, very rigorous risk management process where we are looking at not only quantitative filters, but even qualitative assessments. Uh, and the pillars of our investment philosophy are as follows. So our investment philosophy rests on four very strong pillars. First is uh, a very, very strong focus on fundamental research. Now, we are Philip Ventures IFSC. Uh, you know, we are domiciled in Gift City. So we are a part of the India business of Philip Capital. Uh, if, you, you know, anyone would have had an opportunity to read the research reports that come from Philip Capital India, uh, you, you could acknowledge that these are some of the best pieces of investment literature available on the market today. And the testimony to this fact is that our analysts, our sector specialists are rated anywhere between number three to number one in the respective field. Now, this is about Philip Capital India, but Philip Capital largely, uh, you know, is a global firm. We are domiciled in more than 15 countries globally. And a, fo a focus on fundamental research is, is a concept which is actually stressed on across regions. So that is the kind of responsibility which even we have shouldered at our end. Uh, so our entire idea is to really put deep dive into various asset classes, businesses and regions. Uh, and I'm talking about the investment desk in Gift City uh, to identify investment opportunities. So that is a very strong focus on fundamental research. So that's our first pillar. Second is uh, a lot of data driven capabilities or a quant based approach as we would like to call it. Because by design, our portfolio is a top-down approach portfolio because we are picking and choosing ETFs. So, you know, macro-level uh, indica indicators and macro-level uh, happenings are of utmost critical importance to us. So what we've actually done as part of the fundamental research is that since the past so many months, we have actually built a lot of in-house data-driven capabilities. Now, I'm a chartered accountant myself, but I have always enjoyed coding. You know, it initially started off as a hobby, but now my team and I actually have written a lot of codes to analyze, you know, huge data sets across different geographies, across different businesses, uh, across different regions. Our entire focus is to analyze financial as well as non-financial data. Uh, what the, the argument uh, that we have is that such data-driven approaches is what uh, enables us to eliminate a lot of noise uh, that, you know, otherwise happens around us, uh, you know, especially in the context of global markets where there is so much information available. So we require, a, you know, a process, a framework that enables us to eliminate noise. That's number one. Uh, the It really adds a lot of objectivity to our investment process. So, uh, you know, we are exploring, uh, we've also started uh, employing machine learning techniques as part of our investment research. So, uh, you know, those are the things that we are constantly, uh, you know, uh, innovating new things in-house uh, in order to be able to churn out huge amounts of data and then see, you know, where we can actually observe some trends and insights from different sectors. So, you know, that is the second objective. 
uh, of course i can also add by saying this is that with so much discussion around technology and you know, you know the quant based approach the one thing that we are very clear on is that we will never use a technology to tell us what to buy and what to sell so our systems never give us the trading signals or our systems will never give us with security we should buy or we should sell that is a decision that is taken by the fund manager which is of course me as well as the investment team but what this technology and quant based approaches are really helping us is to to get all the pieces on the chessboard as 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 we would like to call it so that's the second pillar third pillar is is a long term approach so uh, the entire investment strategy for our global pms is that we would really like to focus on uh, you know generating wealth over a very long period of time the entire idea is to invest in some of these high conviction ideas which we believe yeah. will grow over the medium to long term but to that extent uh, in our investment portfolios we do not undertake a lot of frequent portfolio churning because number one there is tax implication also uh, uh, nothing really stops us from exiting a particular theme the moment we have entered into it uh, of course you know everyone uh, i mean everyone can make mistakes and everyone should have an opportunity for course correction but our entire idea is that we will exit a particular theme only and only when our fundamental thesis around that particular investment business or region as the case may be is getting significantly altered because of a particular event or a particular regulation or you know any other happening that is there. and last process at uh, the last pillar of course is seamless implementation a uh, seamless implementation of course i did speak about the data driven capabilities that we have but it has also extended to the entire investment experience uh, uh, to the investor uh, the account opening processes are very very straightforward i did mention to you that uh, the investors don't have to open any bank account in gift city so you know that that really helps them especially the nri investors are uh, you know very very satisfied with our services plus uh, you know we also believe in keeping our investors regularly updated so as part of our work uh, you can find us on linkedin as well uh, as part of our work every month we come out with a monthly newsletter where we deep dive into a particular theme or a particular business which you know otherwise is not investable in india and every week every monday morning we come out with a weekly note it is again uh, you know uh, an attempt to uh, a data driven attempt to address some of the events in the markets and we present our thoughts on uh, you know how these events are so we keep our investors updated about our investment philosophy as well because that gives our investors uh, number one you know some insights on what is happening globally because today you know i would like to believe that investors would be much more updated uh, updated about the indian markets uh, you know than the global markets so at least uh, you know some knowledge gap is something that we would address uh, we we, at, we very humbly uh, attempt to address and it also gives investors uh, uh, an insight into how the fund management team is essentially thinking because you know uh, because in every note uh, we are giving a view and it also reflects in the way we have really positioned our portfolios so you know these are the four pillars of our process and that is what really enables us to uh, quite literally navigate the complex landscape of global markets and uh, serve our investors uh, in their best interests right absolutely and that makes a lot of sense um and uh, even we as uh, wealth managers we there are so many products that are available in the market um and um, currently there are more than 4000 mutual fund schemes absolutely uh, yes so we also collect the data and then um uh, track the consistency of the fund managers and then it helps us to build the uh, different portfolios for our different clients and it's an enabler then uh, then we have to uh, as you rightly said it cannot be the decision maker absolutely maker absolutely where uh, the final decision is also based on the qualitative aspect uh, aspect where you um, analyze the investment thesis and then whether you can relate with the investment thesis of the fund manager right 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 that also plays a lot of uh, role uh so there is uh, and thank you so much for uh, explaining uh, the your product and your investment philosophy in, in so much detail right. uh, here's one question from uh, from the audience yeah. um 
how do you, and you have already touched upon that uh, how do you see the difference in dollar returns and uh, and the returns in uh, INR Correct. and the, how does that uh, how do you relate the rupee depreciation with the interest rate differential in in both the markets and currently we have seen that US yield has also had also gone up right, the interest right. rate differential was not very high and the correct, US correct. USD yield was also looking very attractive so how do you relate the difference in returns with the uh, difference in the interest rate yield of both the uh, countries Correct. So, uh, I mean, one the school of thought here is that the interest rate differential, uh, you know, and essentially moving on the lines of what they call as the REER, which is the real effective interest rate differential. So there, uh, you know, Indian interest rates are higher. Uh, US, uh, you know, as you know, you've rightly pointed out that right now that differential could have been lower uh, because the US interest rates have also, you know, kind of shot up. But over a longer period of time, you know, the longer this differential stays, okay, you can expect, uh, 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 of course, I'll not call it a steady depreciation. A steady depreciation only gets proven after so many years when you actually do a CAGR kind of returns. Right. Uh, our view, in fact, uh, we tell our investors also that while a USD fixed income is looking very attractive right now, uh, if it is for the dollar interest rate, the 5% yield, the answer is yes. Uh, definitely, there is uh, some merit uh, in investing in the shorter end of the yield curve. Uh, and there is demand for such products as well. But, uh, you know, in the next one to two years, expecting a depreciation in the Indian rupee is something which, you know, we will, we would advise investors again. Because, uh, you know, the moment there are uh, these rate cuts in the U.S. markets. Now, currently, uh, you know, the rate cuts are only getting shifted. Uh, that is, uh, again, a different discussion. Because we've always been of the view that uh, because of the elevated prices, uh, the rate cuts will happen only in the second half of this year. We've actually given this view way back in December 23 uh, as part of our weekly notes as well. But it is only now that, uh, you know, those things are actually playing out. Uh, but, uh, you know, moment the moment we find ourselves in a situation where uh, the rate cuts in the U.S. are, you know, much sharper as compared to, let's say, uh, any expected rate cut uh, in India, you could actually find the rupee appreciate. And to that extent, uh, you know, a dollar-based investment, at least if that is the intention, that in a very short term, you will make some quick work on the rupee depreciation. So that is something that may not play out, you know, being being very honest. Yeah. Yes, understood. Uh, and thank you so much for uh, beautifully explaining it. Uh, one next question from the audience. Uh, in, in your global BMS, since you're investing in ETFs, does the taxation uh, is similar uh, whether you're investing in international stocks or ETFs? Um, she can just like on that. Uh, so, uh, uh, from what we understand is that uh, the long-term capital gains taxation, so the taxation is, uh, you know, the rate of taxation is, uh, you know, effectively the same. So, long-term will be taxed at 20% and short-term at your regular rate of taxation. But there is some uh, contention around uh, uh, the period of holding because for U.S. stocks, uh, it is two years. But for uh, global ETFs, uh, whether it is two years or three years is, uh, I believe, a point of debate. Uh, what we recommend mm -hmm. is that, you know, the investors should consult their tax uh, consultants. Uh, in any case, you know, as part of our uh, process, we are not required to deduct any TDS uh, because, uh, let's say, for a local PMS, uh, the PMS has to deduct TDS for NRI investors. In fact, you know, I'll touch upon a different aspect of taxation, taking this opportunity. Uh, you know, my apologies if, if this is a digression. Uh, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we speak about the taxation of our fund, uh, so the fund becomes taxable for or the global PMS. Uh, you know, technically it's not a fund, it is a portfolio. Uh, so the portfolio becomes taxable to a resident Indian investor because it is the global income of the investor. Uh, this is actually income that the, the, the view that we have from our investors, uh, from our consultant is that this is income which is not generated in India. It is global income and hence it will be taxable for a resident Indian individual. For a non-resident individual or a foreign national, the taxation will actually depend on his or her uh, area of domicile. 
So if the investor is coming in from the Middle East, maybe then, you know, of course, there is no tax implication. And for other regions also, their local taxes will apply. There will be no taxation in India. So, uh, I mean, just, just an additional uh, insight. Right, right. And one, one last question from my side, uh, and there is a Wealth managers, we always advise clients to have a long-term investment horizon. Uh, uh, is there any horizon that you re recommend or minimum investment horizon to actually realize the benefit of equity markets? So right. Is there any horizon that you recommend for your PMS? Exactly. And any kind of exit load that is there uh, on the PMS? Sure. So in our PMS, firstly, uh, there is no entry load or exit load. Uh, reason uh, for that is that because we are investing in the global ETFs and one of the uh, parameters that we consider is liquidity. So whenever, you know, there is any redemption, uh, touch wood, there has been no redemption so far, but whenever there is a redemption, it will be a, a fairly seamless for us to actually sell uh, those ETFs and then remit the funds back to the investor. And to that extent, there is no exit load. Uh, that's number one. Uh, as far as the investment horizon goes, so we recommend our investors to stay invested with us, uh, you know, for a minimum period of at least five to seven years, uh, because uh, the kind of uh, investment themes that we are really chasing, uh, the high conviction names, uh, we are really, uh, you know, uh, uh, our intention is to generate that kind of wealth over a longer period of time. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I'll just uh, again add to this. Year 2022, when we actually started our fund, it was actually the true test of our investment philosophy because, uh, you know, we did a significantly spend a lot of time uh, on our global uh, portfolios as far as the backtesting process goes. But year 2022 was the true test of resilience for our portfolio, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, let's say, the risk management processes that we have. And of course, you know, how strongly we are holding on to our conviction. Why do I say so? Because uh, in a year like 2022, some of our ETFs like semiconductors and cloud computing were some of the worst performing themes. Again, not all investors had a similar experience because uh, like a major chunk of them actually came in the second half of 2022. So to that extent, uh, they were quite happy. But, you know, definitely there was uh, a lot of panic, uh, at least in the global markets, but we, we still held on to it. And that is exactly where conviction plays a role, because last year, uh, it is actually semiconductors and cloud computing, at least the ETFs that we chose, that gave us anywhere between 50 to 60% US dollar returns. And I'm talking about ETFs, not individual stocks. So uh, of course, uh, we, not, we, we are not very sure how the year 2024 will play out. But, uh, you know, that is where we uh, keep place a very key role on conviction. Like I mentioned, nothing really stops us from exiting a theme uh, early on. But uh, it uh, we would do it only and only if uh, the fundamental assumptions are a bit shaky. And yeah, hope, hope that uh, that answers. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you so much, Mehi, for uh, to deploy, um, um explaining about the Gift City, about your portfolio. Uh, and answering all the questions. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion and uh, likewise, likewise. audience also enjoyed uh, this as much and we look forward to doing such sessions with, with you and no, 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 absolutely. You know, thank you so much. Uh, you know, just to reintroduce the Philip Capital Group because, uh, you know, people would have heard of Philip Capital in India. Uh, right. But uh, just, just, a, just taking a couple of minutes here. Uh, Philip sure. Capital is headquartered in Singapore, and uh, we uh, are uh, like we have more than uh, like four decades of existence, and we operate in the financial hubs of more than fifteen different countries. Uh, and India has been one of the largest businesses for the group. In India, we've largely been uh, uh, an institutional player, so we've not been a retail player, so to speak. And because we've been very, very active on the sell side, but now we are also, you know, spreading our footprint very fast on the asset based businesses as well. Because Philip Capital as a group is a very large asset manager also. Uh, as a group, we are managing more than $35 billion of assets under management across, you know, different regions. Uh, so we've got businesses in Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, uh, you know, let's say Malaysia, even Turkey for that matter. So these are very strong asset management hubs. 
uh, a very reason why we are introducing this is that uh, we, we, we've got a very strong backing of the global group when we are operating in gift city. And, uh, you know, that is the kind of uh, policies and practices that we have in place for us. Uh, the institutional expertise of Philip Capital and uh, Philip Capital India and the global edge of the Philip Capital group is, you know, what makes our existence the way it is right now. And that is how we are uh, very, very happily serving our investors today. Uh, so, yes, uh, Aditya, thank you so much uh, for the session. Uh, even I really enjoyed uh, the you know doing this uh, this session. Really looking forward to many more such uh, sessions because I think the kind of questions that really came in uh, really gives me the confidence that what we would like to communicate is actually getting communicated across. So you know once again, thank you so much for the wonderful participation, everyone. Thank, yeah. you. thank you so much, Nidhi. Thank you. Yes.